Estás viendo Canal América, Televisión Dominicana para el Mundo. El Tiempo para la Verdad es patrocinado por la Clínica Dental Bernard Fialkov D. Díaz, con especialidades en implantes dentales, laser periodontal, cirugía cosmética. Visítanos en el 5603 de la 214 Street, Bayside, New York, con el teléfono 718-229-3838. Clínica Dental Bernard Fialkov. Sometimes life can be so damn hard. You don't know where to go Everything keeps falling apart yeah. You try to do your best But only God knows That you've given everything you've got But the world takes you down You just keep Welcome to a Time for Truth show. It's a pleasure to have you back with us again tonight. I'm your host, Dr. Bernard Fialkoff, and uh, we have a very interesting show that deals with our children, our youth and the importance of how we educate them and the systems that we use and also integrity and respect, respect for each other and respect between the sexes. You know, very important principles of life. Uh, some of you have wondered how to get more shows and on the screen you see the link you go on YouTube, you click a Time for Truth show, and you hit the subscribe button, and you will be availed of all the previous episodes that we've had now for a few years. We welcome you as a permanent subscriber. So Buddha, tonight we have a very special guest. I'd like you to put her pictures up on the screen as I speak about Dr. Ada Juni Okika the executive director and UN representative for the Center for SDG Global Education, USA. She's an educationist, capacity and development and knowledge management expert. She develops programs, strategies, and organizes education and training, carries out research, and ensures successful implementation of initiatives, especially on peace, women, and school support programs. There you see her speaking. Her strengths in developing ideas into programs and building top performing initiatives have earned her repeated commendations, awards, and formal recognitions from colleagues and peers. As an advocate, she has provided advisory notes to legislative houses on education of children an improvement of community classrooms on quality and inclusive education. She has addressed gender issues on women in less privileged situations and annually she empowers women in community through education, through economic empowerment and trade exchange initiatives. Dr. Okika is a consultant to many international organizations and governments and on the work of the United Nations regarding the 2030 development agenda. The doctor is very passionate about what she does and she is determined to ensure that issues concerning women and girls, youth and children, education in clinical classrooms and grassroots issues are achieved positively well for the 2030 agenda. She aspires to do more in hopes that her accomplishments and many more to come will be remembered in history as a model for the younger generations. In Ada's words, let's step up action for the future we want for our generation. 
This is what drives her efforts and commitment to do what she knows how to do well. And Buddha, let's bid a warm welcome as we bring Dr. Okika up live on our screen. Welcome, doctor. I see you're busy working there. You don't stop. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you, Dr. Fleto. Thank you for inviting me to this program. You know, when I saw you at your UN program back in August and the gala that you had afterwards, uh, there's certain feeling that I get around people as a surgeon of 40 years. I make very quick decisions because I need to as a surgeon. And I saw that you're a very sincere human being and that you really have a lot of good people with you. So it's my pleasure to have you. I want to get right to the show because there's so much we want to cover. I want to ask you, as a young girl, what were your dreams for your future life? Um, when you are young and you grew up with, in the midst of a family, that is uh, promising to bring up their children in the right way. You are giving opportunities to explore your inherent potentials. So one of the advantage I had was, I was given this opportunity by my late parents to explore myself as number one. So in exploring myself, I identify certain skills that um, I could develop in me. And one of those skills was being humanitarian to people. So that led me to direct my dream towards um, uh, humanity causes, humanity causes or profession that led me into being a teacher. I had wanted to go into the medical field, but because as a young child, even under the age of three, four years, I was being mandated to take care of the young ones, you know, following me being the eldest of the family. So, and again, in that community, being grown up in the in a in a in a village setting, uh, 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 children were always around me to take care of them. So I grew up and then sought myself to align my dream to become a, 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 a supporter, a developer, a model for children around me that's one while i was in teenage age in in middle school my passion deviated from this aspect of the uh, uh, because while in that two things were happened to me as a teenage girl my late father being an attorney during holidays he takes me to the court so especially when there are days where women will, will speak or preside in the court, we want to take me to court to see these women. And he had expected me to go into the either medical field or the legal career. But that wasn't my, I never liked that course, that, that, that angle. So all his effort to so my direction to be an attorney didn't work. But what interested me most was while at the middle school, um, I heard a lot about a, a, an uncle, an uncle who was then the Secretary General of Commonwealth. And I was passionate about that aspiration, that kind of life, that kind of career. And I began to wonder 
is it only men that carry such uh, that level not until my late parents educated me about potential is not only for men women can be secretary and they told me about united nations they told me about unesco world health organization all those international organizations and that triggered my act my 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 passion because one interesting thing was that it is a, a platform of advocacy and to develop policies that can have influence humanity so i began to nurse the idea of being a part of United Nations. So when I had a little opportunity uh, to uh, see United Nations headquarters, I didn't waste time in marrying it. Apart from that, my career as an educator, I had my career in education as a teacher, as a school administrator, as um, a leader in education that is aside my passion to go the direction of diplomatic affairs and i'm glad that uh, i've been able to plant my foot step in that dimension that's very it's a, amazing the sequence and the steps and you know, really gives a good understanding of how you got to where you got to. Uh, engineer, I think we have a video of the doctor. Do you have that almost ready or? Okay, if the video is ready, uh, let's play that video of, of Dr. Okika for our viewers. And so they can see her receiving a, an award from a international group that's bringing peace and consciousness to our world. Let's play that video if you have it there ready for us. Good evening, everyone. I thought, I hope we have people in the house. Good evening, everyone. Excellencies, my lost spiritual and temporal. It is exciting again for us to gather together and talk about peace is a time when conflicts have told the other of our daily existence. It's also my honor to personally appreciate Dr. Chow and the entire family of Fopal for their commitment on conscience and love in order to address peace across the world. To advocate for peace, speak and maintain peace, we must start from our conscience. We must start from our conscience, our inner being. As most of us have just said, our conscience and our inner being is the seat of peace across the world, starting from the personal existence. We must recognize the battles in our conscience and be able to control those, those battles without allowing the battles to lead us out of our conscience. We must consider the plight of women in their domestic chores, career responsibilities, and family well-being and be a part of their peaceful existence. Beautiful. So yeah. congratulations on that award right. from Fopal. And, uh, you know, I want to ask you, with that theme of consciousness and integrity in mind, what do you feel needs to be established in our present world in order to control gender-based violence of women and young girls? Um... Just as you rightly heard me speak at that event, we have to look at our conscious, our inner self. We need to listen to our inner self. When you are able or you adopt that strategy of listening to your inner self, and that is when your inner being 
directs you, guides you, uh, uh, coordinates you, and models you. Now, your inner conscious will be one that can say, go and beat this woman. Go and abuse this girl. Or don't do that. Or keep her. Reserve yourself. Be humane. Think about humanity. Think about people around you. So the, what is the most important in, in our journey as individuals? In order to curtail some of these vices that are existing today across the world, is to develop our inner conscience. And until we develop that, I, I agree that a lot of policies are in place, gender-based, uh, this and that, uh, policies are coming in, the UN Women and the United Nations are doing so much to ensure that gender-based violence are put to a stop. But the far remains that, as the elders in my in my race says, you can take a horse to the river, but you cannot force the horse to drink water. So what is that? We can do all these policies, you can do all these advocates, you can do all the talking, you can develop all the policies and laws. But if the people do not develop their inner conscience, their inner being, we might not be able to achieve 100% result and outcome where it comes to gender-based violence. Today, in spite of several years, I know years back, the one of the themes for uh, the Commission on Status of Women was violence against women. A lot of issues, even men did a lot of advocacy top policies, a great conclusion came on violence against women. Not up to 10 years ago, yet, what is happening today? You go to the media, social media, you see how a woman is killed, how a woman is brutalized, how a woman is strangled to death, and uh, uh, how she was maltreated. Girls are being raped like nonsense. So, we need to think about building the inner self, the inner mind, developing our conscience positively to always allow our thoughts to be positive in reasoning. Just as you asked me what was my aspiration, and I just mentioned to you how it all started and how I even got to this level. It was built from my inner conscience. It wasn't built from the outer world. I lost my dream, I explored myself from my inner conscience. And anything I do is guided by my inner self. So we've gotten to a level where if you are a kid, if you are an adult, if you are a man, if you are a director, if you are an ambassador, whatever you think you are, you think about your inner self. What is your inner self, your inner being talking to you? Is it telling you to go and kill someone? Or is it telling you to think of how to make a wasteless society waste useful? So this is very important at this time where things are going wrong in all dimensions. You know, doctor, you're so right in what you're saying. Because you see, like you, like you mentioned, you see so much legislation, so much rhetoric and talking but you're, you're you're i agree with you totally that in the end result it's the integrity self-respect and honor of each person to you know to really respect another human being their rights and um you know that this is really the way to happiness is to have people follow some common sense, morality, and treating other people as they would want to be treated. Uh, I, I really wholeheartedly agree with you. And, you know, uh, I want to get to another topic that you are very strong on. Uh, and I want to ask you, because I know you're involved a lot with the United Nations, 
How do you feel we can best accomplish the sustainable, uh, you know, development goals of education in today's world? When the SDG came out in 2015, the post-2015 agenda, it was, there was a review on evaluating the Millennium Development Goals. Where did it work and where did it fail? And that's what the solid rock on which Sustainable Development Goal came up. Now, one of the important aspects of that SDG is education. Whether you are looking at SDG 16, SDG 1, SDG 10, or whatever SDG, what drives it is education. So, and then the quality and inclusive education, which is SDG 4, seems to cap it all. So, education is the paramount of whatever we are doing for any nation development. Education is the key. In any family where you, there is no education, you cannot help that family to advance. So education is the bedrock of the SDGs. And that is why the, the UN and the, 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 the member states they, they are all striving to see how best that the remaining years of the 2030 agenda, that there will be great success and impact through education. You are aware of the Transforming Education Summit. A lot of issues were discussed. And things are being aligned towards the, the outcome on that summit, that globally. And um, in our own capacity, in my own organization, we have been advancing the issues concerning uh, education in rural communities. Why? Because I grew up in a rural community and I see that the challenges in rural communities are yet to be advanced, are yet to be improved upon. Education is still backward in most communities. Communities where children don't have access to school, children don't, don't have reading and writing materials, children don't have good school, good infrastructure, good building, Children don't have quality teachers in the community. And these are the children that the UN is also including in saying, leave no one behind. So we pick this issue to address concerns on the issue of education in rural communities. How best can we improve the standard? And this got worse during the COVID-19, where there was two-year lockdown. People in urban cities, children in urban cities, we are comfortable going to school, even in developing countries. But the children in rural communities couldn't go to school. Rather, their life were more at risk. Most of the girls were being violated. A lot of them got pregnant. Uh, the men were being sent into uh, uh, various ills, smoking, uh, um, robbery and so many things that was existing because nothing kept them busy for two years they were not in school and instead of being idle they decided to tow the other dimension so education is a paramount to what we are doing and i believe that the sustainable development goal is really doing well is really advancing greatly and ensuring that Within the remaining years of the 2030 agenda, quality and inclusive education for lifelong learning should be greatly achieved. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, you uh, also have some certain initiatives that I want to ask you about and what your philosophy is and how you go about accomplishing it in terms of your initiatives that you have for capacity building and knowledge management, 
um, you know, what is your viewpoint on how to go about, uh, you know, doing that? We're getting near the end of the show, but I know this is important to you. Well, one thing is for you to come up with a passion that you want to drive. What is it that is dear to your heart for humanity? Because the bone of contention all drives towards humanity. So when you're able to come up with um, a passion, an idea from your heart, the next thing is to develop it. The next thing is to advance it, address it before advancing it. You develop it, address it by creating the awareness from your community, from your environment, and then taking it out, creating the awareness on that passion. Then when the awareness is created, you don't think of advancing it. Now, how do you advance it? You begin to build your networks. You begin to build your partnerships. You begin to build your coalition. You begin to adv advance your, the initiative with... In uh, you begin to advance the issue with initiatives and campaigns. And you begin to now advocate for people to understand you and know why this is very important. By then, you have built your capacity. You have built your strength. Now, the next one now is to advocate for it. Say, for instance, I've known you. You can knock at your door and say, Doctor, this is my, my passion. This is what I want to address. This is why it is important, why it is necessary, why we need to talk about it. Being that I have known you, I've met you, and then you review it and say, Yes, Dr. Ada, it's worth doing. We'll be glad to join you address it. So you see, it's a gradual process. You cannot just wake up and then start doing something without turning it into a, a, a real way of success. So there must be need for you to come up, fix it, and then drive the train on its railway, not on all railways. Each idea, each initiative, has its own railways. And if you don't drive it along its railway, then you are either failing or you are not serious with it. So one more thing to do that, when I came up with the issue of um, um, education, it started from the fact that I was a teacher. I taught in the community school. Yeah, you must have heard about the Boko Haram area in Nigeria. I taught in that area as a young girl. And I saw some of the challenges, you know, stampeding uh, education, advancement of quality and inclusive education in those communities. And it became my headache. Why should only... Uh, 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 good schools be in urban and capital cities. What is wrong taking an American British school to a village in a remote area? What is wrong in doing that? Why must we be concentrated in a capital, like for instance, Nigeria, where I come from? Why must all schools be concentrated in Lagos and Abuja? What of those areas of Boko Haram or other communities that we have people who need quality education. We have professors, we have attorneys, we have doctors, we have professionals, we have diplomats. Why can't they be taken to them and give them the opportunity to be like their counterparts in urban areas? So what we have to address is this. Drive your idea, come out with an idea address it and then put it on the machinery for it to work for it to be implemented for it to be more meaningful for humanity just like every other thing just you are now talking through the radio for this project it's something that someone came up with and then we are cute to it by the time you ad 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 advance it people will begin to queue into it that's the way it becomes a success 
Look at me and you talking through the radio and reaching out to the global community. This is exactly what we need to do. You are bringing this, your initiative, this idea into this, uh, through this network for people to hear. Most people don't have this opportunity. Likewise, any other ideas that one can come up with. The important thing is drive your idea. And I can see behind you a time for truth. So this is time for actually, this is time for truth. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, doctor. So definitely we need to, as Dr. Okika said, let's look at humanity, drive the idea. It's a time for truth. Thank you so much for being on the show. Unfortunately, we had too good a time. We've run out of time, but it was a wonderful oh show. God. And for those of you watching the doctor and time for truth, let's drive the idea. Let's improve humanity. Let's educate. Let's respect each other. And let's have honor. Have a great night. Thank you, doctor, for inviting me. And I want to appreciate your crew the members of your team for this opportunity. And I believe that you will use this time for truth to advance the cause that can better humanity for our generation. I thank you. Absolutely. You're quite welcome, doctor. Good night to all. Good night to all. <laughs>